back to the air conditioning on this beautiful 1986 Mercedes 560 SL. So over in the previous video I explained what my findings were and I went through all my test procedures I explained in the previous video. Now we're at the final fill. I have it filled up. It's been running for 20 minutes now. I've been going over the system looking for leaks again because we knew we had leaks. It came in with 1011 PSI of vapor pressure in it. We found a lot of oil all over the accumulator, oh, accumulator, sorry, receiver dryer. Um, I often say the wrong word for the wrong device when you look back in my videos. I think at one of my other videos, I, I think I called the receiver dryer a evaporator. Uh, I don't edit mistakes out. So, getting back to this. This was totally drenched in oil. Oil on every fitting, oil on every sensor. Could not tell where the leak was coming from. I pre-tested it. I nitrogen pressure tested, vacuum tested it. Uh, UV light, now that I have the system up and running, went with UV light. I think we could probably get in there. You could see the glowing in the sight glass. Now the sight glass is still crystal, pretty crystal clear. There's a little buildup on the inside. Oh, speaking about buildup, something I didn't talk about in the other video. And remember, if you want a light, this is the light to get. One step up, if you want to get a light better than this one, you get the OptiMax 365. But when you see the price of the OptiMax 365, you might be going, hell no. <laughs> But if you're really serious in this business and you really, really want to help find leaks and have every, everything that can help you to the very last bit with the best light possible, the Opti 365 is the way to go. But for your daily driver, you could use this. Especially if you're gonna handle it to employees. If you're the owner or if you're the operator and it's your own, you get the Opti 365. But if you're gonna rough service it, and give it to somebody else to use you give somebody these because it's so much cheaper and still really really good so getting back no leaks under pressure no leaks with dye no leak with the refrigerant identifier no leak using bubbles so this is one of those leaks and it's really hot this is one of those leaks that probably only happen at a certain pressure or when the dryer hits a certain temperature and the metal expands between some device and it's bleeding out the refrigerant oil. But statically, sitting here, high RPMs, low RPMs, turning it on and off, under no situation is this one leaking right now. Service valves. Change them every time on old vehicles. Don't get them. Here's another thing. Now let's take a really good look at this. This is the service valve I took out of the high pressure discharge line from the compressor at that location, from the compressor to the condenser. What do you notice? Okay, what I will tell you, the body is like a chromium steel, you know, stainless steel or something like that, but the very valve in is brass. But does that look like brass to you? It looks pretty black. That is the part that sits inside the refrigerant flow there. It should look like one of those brass ends there. Not one of these silver ends, but brass, but you see it's black. That's because this system was ran really low on refrigerant. It got really, really hot. Some damage is already done. The oil coke, probably a combination of moisture in the system too. Not really bad from what my, uh, micrometer told me it's not definitely not the worst system I've ever seen uh, but this has been baked so even if you did charge it up you would tell your customer there's already evidence that this compressor ran really really hot way past the temperature that would cause damage to either a compressor the rings the oil you know you there's no way you can, can guarantee your refrigerant recharge you can guarantee refrigerant because refrigerant doesn't wear out it only leaks out by the containment of the vessel or the system that is it, it is in and we got a 1986 vehicle here come on man what do you think okay so we have original hoses 
come back and check your low side pressure hoses when the system is running when it's cold because sometimes leaks develop only when it's running and the metal gets cold it shrinks the rubber is no longer elastic anymore it doesn't shrink and it starts leaking like a sieve at one of the seams where the crimps are or in the hoses under pressure you might not see no leaks coming out of the little pressure release there's little tiny holes they made in the skin of the hose going all over but when you hit it with the leak protectant uh something like this and you put it all over there and all of a sudden you'll see bubbles just pouring out of there you turn the system off you turn the car off and the pressure raises and it gets warm and the bubbles stop coming out i've seen that so that's a hard one to leak because that only happens when it's running and it only happens a little bit and no oil or no dye comes up through the heating of the outer layer because this is some hoses are two layers on this really old stuff and some are three layers on the later stuff once you got into R134 and you had a barrier hose inside. So it has to travel through barriers and it could leak in one spot, go a foot down the hose under one layer and then come out in another area and then it will come out through the micro holes that are every inch or so on the sheathing of the outer protective layer. That's another leak. We're not getting any of that on this one right now, but we know we have one there. Nothing showing at the shaft seal, and you can get a leak at the shaft seal only when the compressor is running. But if the compressor is running and you have a fan going, how can you find a leak? Because it's going to be blowing away the refrigerant. There is a way to do it because of safety, and I'm not going to explain how to do it, and I don't even want to go there. Uh, it's just a little too dangerous, especially with people who are unexperienced. I still have all my fingers. I know guys who don't, so we won't get in it, but there is ways to test that. Uh, what else can I tell you about this that I didn't tell you on the last video? Let's see. Oh, fans. Okay, the electric fan's not working. I drove the pressure uh, up the RPMs. It went to 340 PSI, and the electric fan still didn't come on. Through the electric fins for the uh, fan switch, this fan, the electric one, is supposed to come on. It did not. So, is it the switch? Is it the fan? Is it the fuse? Is it the relay? My shop will find that out. But we know we are going from the previous video. I told you that the compressor will be changed later. later. The receiver and all the switches will be changed later. So I'm leaving that up to them to find. Sometimes I do it, but I have too much work and i just let them do that they charge diagnosis the material stuff like that I do, I do my part i charge they do their part they charge customer gets a good system so we know that another one thermal fan clutch now thermal fan clutches after 30 to 50 thousand miles and that looks really good right now it's been running a real long time but it took a real long time for it to work and this is where a non-contact high quality kind of expensive thermal imaging gun comes into not the cheap little $19 one or any of the other ones I, you don't, don't never mind don't trust them. something up there in the $400 $500 range some of the $150 range ones you take the temperature and because it's shiny and it's metal aluminum it has uh, emissivity which is the reflectant of heat it doesn't like to take a really good temperature using optical and opticals don't like hot or cold air, like this hot air going over their optics. It distorts them and gives you a false reading. Something they don't mention in a lot of the literature, especially the automotive guys. So that thermal fan clutch works great for engine cooling, but doesn't work great for the amount of air that's needed. So it gives you some false readings. And if this customer wants to put this back to near OEM original day one off the factory floor, I would highly recommend changing that thermal thermal fan clutch down there. And that's a fluid filled clutch with a little bi uh, my bi metallic in it, and they do go out, but they don't go out enough to where they affect the engine coolant, but it will affect the flow of refrigerant. There's some other ways to uh, make some other tests, but I'm not going to talk about those because of a little danger. Um, 
104,000 original change it. So this will get a compressor. This will get a fluid driven thermal fan clutch. They will find what is wrong with the fan circuit, why it is not engaging electrically. That's another issue. Uh, but this customer will get a good working operating system for now, other than that fan. I told him, do not use the air conditioning without that electric fan working. Because before that thermal fan clutch gets hot, it allows this to go to like 340 PSI, and today is a cool day. Today, outdoor bulb temperature, 72 degrees and that's only because of the rotating heat coming under the engine and being sucked back up to this thermistor right here but actually the outside temperature is only about 62 degrees that is just a little bleed of recycled air under giving you this pulse higher temperature so if it was 90 degrees outside and this electric clutch doesn't or this electric fan doesn't work and it takes 20 minutes before this thermal fluid fan clutch kicks in and actually gives a good flow. And you start up at 90 degree day, the, the black top down here on a 90 degree day on a pot with no wind or anything, the black top could be, the air at this level could be 110 degrees going up into your condenser. So you're in stop and go traffic with 110 degree air entering your condenser and you don't have an electric fan working and you don't have a good working fluid control you will see that 440 what will go above and beyond where that blow off uh, valve right there will just release and release your refrigerant because you exceeded if you're if you're that lucky but if you're not lucky you will slip the clutch on your compressor and burn out your compressor clutch or maybe because this is 1986 the high side pressure hose may give and burst so many things could be damaged but it all came because this is not working that great and this is not working at all but in this low temperature everything seems to be working fine now even at idle my suction line temperature is reading 39 degrees but look where i'm taking my suction line temperature off i'm taking my suction line temperature off way down here and i have like 180 degree air, 160 degree air blowing over. I don't have that insulated. So that's actually colder than that 39 or 40 degrees that's showing there. And I don't have that insulated. It is much colder than that. Uh, before the radiator heated up and I was putting hot coolant air and condenser air over it, that was measuring at 33 degrees at the suction line there. And that was even measuring after, what do we have here? we have the fuel line cooler. So we have a heat exchanger right here, cooling the gas from the fuel line, adding heat to the refrigerant. So to stop knocking and peaking, one of the pinging, one of the things to do was to try to chill down and to stop the vaporation, vapor, got my English is bad right now, but to stop air bubbles from forming inside the gas lines. From the tank, they run the gasoline through a heat exchanger, chill down the heat exchanger, and then feed it to the engine. So you have added heat to the refrigerant. So this is another thing. Somebody has a problem with fuel injection, uh, drivability problem. They're in Los Angeles, it's 110 degrees, stop and go, under hood heats are excess of 200 degrees, and you have a dead AC system or a low AC system, so you have no super uh, subcooling left over and you you're delivering warm 90 degree vapor to the cooling and it's not getting cooling you develop drivability problems this was there to get rid of the drivability problem just under those certain situations but if you allow the AC to be undercharged because somebody was using cans and they were guessing and they were trying to use pressures or temperatures then you hinder the fuel delivery system because the fuel delivery system on these vehicles is incorporated inside here. Getting back to air conditioning again, what you see it's related to many other things. I think I told you what I needed to tell you on this second video. I know I'm forgetting something, we'll leave it off from there. You'll probably be seeing this vehicle back again in several months probably after summer unless something gives out 
or they tell me it's the fan cycle switch is bad and they can't let the customer use this AC on hot days or any days because it will something will give um, then I'll be back down here I'll do a recovery they'll throw the fan cycle switch on and uh, they'll have a fan hopefully hopefully it's just a relay a fuse or the fan or a connector something easy because if I have to change the fan cycle switch this one opens up into the refrigerant circuit and the refrigerant needs to be released or recovered before that gets done so let's hope it's not the switch and it's one of the other things and I got to get out here and get up to other jobs signing off don't forget dry nitrogen purging uh, field piece uh, HCFM DC vacuum pump with the easy oil change with the backup oil on the side that you can change the oil on the fly while you still have it on and you're pulling the vacuum you can swap out the oil container and put in the new one without using vacuum Navex 12 CFM 3 micron rated vacuum pump uh, we have AccuTools uh, blue uh, vacuum hose the whole vacuum hose kit we have blue vac micron in this situation, I'm actually using valve core tools. These are the Appian valve core removing tools that I have inside there. For refrigerant identification, we have Neutronics uh, refrigerant ID. For leak checks, we have what used to be uh, Yokogawa in my day back in the 70s. My dad's old GE, but it was all the same thing. The H10 uh, used to be plug in the wall. For the fastest, recoveries that I've ever performed of any portable equipment ever and it hands down beats anything that is sold on the automotive market it is the NAVAC four cylinder and you actually have to look up this part number right here to get this unit and nothing beats this that I've ever used or been into any of the conventions or expos for selling for refrigerant recovery in this chassis size for this amount nothing has ever beat this Coming back for leak checking for your UV, your OptiPro Max for, I would say this is budget. This is the best budget one you could get, but it's the best on the market until you get to the Opti 365. But when you look up the Opti 365, 99.99% of you will buy this one and not buy the Opti 365 just because of the price. Don't forget Nylog on all your uh, fittings where you have to make sealant for doing uh, deep vacuum pulls. And I will, oh yeah. And don't forget your field piece for your test probes. Um, like here for your test probes. And that's it. Oh, rain is coming down. So I need to get my tools because it's starting to rain. And catch you guys on the very next video. Oh, and I forgot the, the leak scene, uh, looking for bubbles for this stuff, thick glue. And that's it. Catch you guys on the next video. This one we'll see after summer.